viva paz. Que viva las ideas de paz y justicia. Long live the ideas of peace and justice. This lady's uh, grandmother had this isolated view that you keep your wishes to yourself. My grandmother had a slogan, ignorance is bliss. Bliss, you know, is happiness. Well, most of the world, especially today, is brought up decidedly from the point of view of the capitalist system and their politicians to be ignorant. They don't want us to know about all of these, their evils. That's why they want to smash WikiLeaks, incarcerate Assange and Chelsea Manning and keep them from us. They are our comrades. We need them. My book is on sale here for what it cost me to bring it to Denmark from New York where it was published. It cost 100 kroner. And I have other books here that are free, and I have a book on Venezuela uh, for 20 kroner. My companion and lover, Yetta Sally, has made the illustrations of the book, which you will be seeing here. And uh, those illustrations and the books are at the back. I've begun a little bit differently than I had planned, but I was inspired by this young woman. And I want to talk about the world today, of course, and why it is that we have so much stress. I read a lot of documents and opinion polls, and I've learned that we all live in a chronically sick world. I mean this world is very sick. And most of us who live in it are also sick. Not that we all want to be sick, but many of us don't know how to be healthy. I have a feeling that many of you young people here are learning how to be healthy. And I want to be inspired by you. The other, another week or so ago, uh, the, uh, the Danish uh, Health Institute came out with a ministry, came out with a, uh, a report on stress among young women in uh, Denmark. They found that 46% of girls who had reached the age of 19 had been to see one or more times psychologists or psychiatrists. That is certainly an indice of a very sick world. Much of their problems have to do with, who am I? And an angst, a stress that, that I'm not good enough. I'm not intelligent enough. I won't get a job. I won't have a lover, or he'll leave me. We are confronted constantly with stress as a national disease. In the United States, the recent Gallup poll, Gallup is a rather conservative organization, but it's the major, most popular, well-known polling institution. And it came to the conclusion, out of having tested many thousands of people in 100 countries, around 100 countries, I don't remember the exact figure, but they found that the, the country with the most stress was Greece. 59% of the people they interviewed gave them evidence that they were full of stress. What was the number second? The second country? The devil's empire itself. The country where I was born. The United States of so-called America. We must remember that America begins in Argentina and goes all the way up to Alaska. But the Yankees want to steal the name. The Yankees want to steal anything they can. And how do you do that? Well, among other things, by dominating the media and by making wars. Some of the sickness that many of our young people have, I should probably not mention, because I see that there are some people here 
with tattoos and holes in their pants. And maybe I should not say that because I will become unpopular. But I do believe that if you go out of your way to buy clothing with holes in them already, there is something sick about that. You know, or you want to impress somebody, I don't know what you're supposed to be impressing them with. And then we have all these people with tattoos everywhere, on their faces even. I think this is an indication that we live in a world of insecurity, of identity crisis, and why is that? We live in a state of permanent war. A great Danish poet, two years ago, his name is Henrik Norbrandt, two years ago, wrote this poem, Lullaby. <clears throat> Little war child, where are you going? East or west? Where in the world do you believe you can find a friend? Little war child, what suits you best? A worn carpet, a plywood coffin, a life jacket. Little war child, will, where will you die? Where the bombs fall or in the open sea? Little war child, where do you want to go? Choose yourself, just we never see you again. My speech is filled with Grayness, blackness, troubles. But I hope to end with some. Can you hear me without the microphone? No. No. <laughs> you can't hear me without the microphone. We Do can I have hear to start you again? If I have to start again, I get my, my time to make back. Huh? <laughs> um, my book, uh, The Peace Threat. The Russian peace threat, Pentagon on alert. You know, if, if you're for peace, you're a threat. Definitely a threat to one of the major corporations in the whole world, the weapons industry. I have a lot of statistics, facts in my book, and I can stand by every one of them. I'm willing to debate any general about what I write. Of course, I have my own analysis. And uh, I choose to start my book with uh, Yuri Gagarin, who from Russia, on the 12th of April, 1961, traveled around the world in his spacecraft, around the planet. And when he landed, he said he saw the planet for its beauty and hoped that we human beings would preserve its beauty and not destroy its beauty and that we must live in peace. Khrushchev, who was the state's uh, minister then, president, sent him around the world for two years with, uh, with a peace message. We see him, well, fortunately I didn't have it in, on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the screen, but uh, we see him holding uh, 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 Picasso's peace dove um, in some of his travels. Well, you can't really see it here, but it's in my book. Now, what country did not want to have him present? Of course, the United States of America. And one of the reasons why they didn't want to have him in their country was because that same day that he went around the world, John, uh, uh, Nixon, uh, yeah, Nixon, Johnson, they all are like Kennedy was interviewed by somebody in the media who, who had suspicion that they were about to invade Cuba. And he said, no, we're not, we're not about to invade Cuba. The very next day, April 13th, 1,400 mercenaries, mostly exiles from Cuba, paid for, armed for, and trained, supported, transported by mainly the CIA, with, of course, Pentagon help, sailed on US warships from Guatemala to Cuba. Two days later, eight US bombers, 26 bombers, dropped many bombs on the Cuban airport, trying to destroy the small air force that Cuba had. And they succeeded in destroying half of those uh, ships, uh, planes. Two days later, April 17th, the, the uh, mercenaries landed on the shores of Cuba in what is known as the Bay of Pigs. 
It took the Cuban militia, mainly the Cuban militia and some Cuban troops, three days to stop them. The same month, in March and April, JFK, President Nixon, as <laughs> Kennedy, sent uh, so-called advisors, army advisors, to South Vietnam to help the dictator there uh, put down a national, a, a national uproar. People who wanted what they thought would be a better government, democracy, some communists were involved, many Buddhists were involved. North Vietnam had not yet become involved. But at any rate, the, uh, the Yankees decided they wanted a war against Vietnam. On the 21st to 26th of April, the same month, the CIA was helping four French generals uh, murder or regime change President de Gaulle because of two reasons. He didn't want to be a he didn't want to be bossed by NATO, so he pulled his troops out of NATO, and he didn't want to continue a war against Algiers. Many capitalists in, Al in, in France and, of course, generals uh, wanted the war because they didn't want the Algerian people to have their own freedom. They tried to kill him, de Gaulle, and they failed. In Washington, the French ambassador and Kennedy met, and Kennedy was told, told Kennedy told the French ambassador that he couldn't stop the CIA, that they were able to manipulate beyond the powers of the president. Now what I'm telling you can be found, these are documented statements that I'm making, the, the words are different, but I'm not going to read the exact words or we'll be here all night. A few months later, in 62 August, 12 fascists in the secret army organization, which, is a part, which was a part of something called Operation Gladio, which was a major arm of the CIA, organized another attempt against de Gaulle, and two of his uh, bodyguards were murdered. He and his wife escaped. Uh, three, 15 months after that, Kennedy was murdered, and I cannot prove it 100%, but I am one of those so-called conspiratorial theorists that are quite sure that the CIA planned and executed his murder. It would take me another 45 minutes to try to prove that, but I will say quickly about it that one of the mafia bosses that was involved, it was the combination of CIA and mafia and some gusanos from Cuba, say Cuban exiles. And uh, one of them was the boss of Chicago, San Giancani, and he, his son and nephew wrote a book after he was murdered, which they said was done by the CIA. And in the book, he says who killed him, Kennedy, and who killed Marilyn Monroe. He names the people. One of the names was Howard Hunt, who had been a major CIA officer in engagement of uh, warfare against Cuba and attempts to murder Fidel Castro. Now, somehow or another, it's quite all right to murder these guys if you don't like them, if they're communists or whatever. They don't even have to be communists, but if the United States does it, it seems to be okay. Even the U U.S. Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives in the mid to late 70s made uh, investigations, select committees of intelligence, in which they said it was definitely a conspiracy and many people were involved, not just Oswald. And the CIA was created by Harry Truman, who should have never been president, it was a, you know, it was a mistake, he even thought it was a mistake himself. He was just kind of a homey guy from Missouri. He didn't know much about world politics. He took over when uh, Roosevelt died. Roosevelt wanted to have peace with uh, the Soviet Union, even with Stalin, for whatever crimes he either committed or is alleged to have committed, and I'm no Stalin fan, and I don't get into my book, nor do I want to get into it here, how good he was for the nation. 
But it was their nation, and they were allies with the United States. This, unfortunately, they had to make allies with him because he finally, he, or the Russian people, I must always say, the Russian people were finally defeating the Nazis after three years of occupation in many places. Part of it was Ukraine. I can't get into Ukraine very, I don't have time. But Ukraine is in my book, and I know we have someone here from Ukraine. And Syria is in my book, but I can't get into all these issues, I'm sorry. But they're false flags. The Ukrainian situation is clearly, it was clearly a coup d'etat in 2014. The Syrian is very complicated, and there are many countries involved, and I can't prove one thing or another in a couple of minutes that I have. But the United States has been involved in war since the beginning of its time. Truman said to his biographer in 1974, it was a terrible mistake of me to create the CIA. They are far, they go far beyond what they were called to, on to do when he created them in 47. But one of the things that is in their mission, and you can read it in various documents, is to create lies. They call them gray and, and black propaganda. They print, they plant something in a newspaper, a total lie. And they have many ways of planting things in newspaper. They can buy their, their announcements and make it look like a news report. They can buy the, uh, the, the, the editor or the reporter. It gets into one newspaper or one radio station and then they can get it through to many others. And, and everybody after a while thinks, oh, well, that newspaper said it, it must be true. Uh, a man that I came to know was one of the first whistleblowers of the CIA, Phil Agee. He wrote the book, uh, The CIA Diary, and he explains this. He was a part of that process. We've had many CIA officers come over to us. Today, there's an organization of ex-CIA and military intelligence officers that's called the Veterans of uh, VIPS the Veterans of Intelligence Professionals for Sanity. Um, you can read about their, their points of view and their documents on a website call, called Consort, Consortium News. Uh, you should read what they write about Russiagate. They know personally how Russiagate was created. It was created by an ex-Obama uh, CIA director now named John Brennan. I should come to that later on, I'm sorry. But at any rate, the CIA is a mafia. Uh, the CIA began uh, meddling in other people's elections since their beginning, in 1948 in Italy. It was almost for sure that the elections would be won by the com a combination of communists and socialists. They made sure it didn't happen. They made sure that the same thing didn't happen in Greece. In 46 to 49, they supported a military uh, junta again in 67 to 74. I mean, it would take me all afternoon to read to you the invasions, the election manipulations, the national leaders that the CIA, that is to say, the United States government, has created wars and murders. I'll just tell you two more presidents who said, and we have evidence that they said this, that they could not control the CIA. When uh, Putin became president in, uh, in Russia, uh, he and Bush thought that they could be friends. Uh, Putin helped uh, uh, George Bush uh, in his war against the Afghanistan people because they had Taliban as a government who had refused to accept a, an oil industry from the United States, from California, Unicol's, a project to uh, build a, a, an oil pipeline under their soil from the Caucasus. That was a no-no. Now, the United States had been quite happy to have the Taliban in power. They didn't give a damn about how they mistreated children or women or any of those so-called human rights issues, but what they were concerned about was getting that oil into their hands. So, they made a war against Taliban. Now, Taliban does have some terroristic activities. And then, you know, we get uh, Al-Qaeda, which was started by the United States. Bin Laden was their man in Afghanistan. So, uh, Putin also had tro troubles with terrorists who wanted to split uh, his areas. And the CIA was stirring up uh, terror problems in uh, Baku. 
And Putin said to George Bush, you know, you need to do something about that. You know, George Bush was one of those presidents that loves to cuss. You know, Nixon and Johnson, they love to use cuss words. And, and you know, Bush's favorite was, um, let's kick ass. So he told Putin, you know, well, I'll, I'll, you know, give me some real proof about that and I'll kick ass. So the CIA sent uh, the new Russian uh, intelligence agency a letter. And, you know, you can find it. And uh, I'm not going to read all the words. But it says basically, yes, we're supporting uh, all the opposition political groupings in that area, and we will continue to do so. Boom, period. And Putin said to Bush, what about that? No reply. No reply. The United States according to my research, has been involved in 573 wars and has been involved in thousands and thousands of military operations, especially, of course, in Latin America. They started this thing called Manifest Destiny, that's to say, expand the territory of the United States after they won their revolution. First war was a hundred years war, which are the states now of the eight states, including California and New Mexico and Colorado and Texas and others. The list goes on and on. And where are we in the Second World War? Where are we with uh, the, the, the depression of 29? Um, all of the major corporations, the big capitalist corporations, the Morgan Banks, the Rockefeller Oil, the DuPonts, Bethlehem Steel, U.S. Steel, <coughs> AT&T, Telegraph and Telephone, Guggenheim, Copper, Copper Industry, including Senator Prescott Bush, who's the father of two presidents later on. He was with the banks called Brown Brothers, Harriman. IBM, General Motors, Henry Ford, Texaco, which is now Exxon, DuPont, Alcoa Aluminum, Mellon, United Electric, all of them sold their products, oil, machinery, aluminum, vehicles, to Hitler, Mussolini, and Franco, including into the war's time. They were the same people who hired, they thought they hired, a very popular Marine general, the most popular man perhaps uh, to, to lead his troops, and the second in command of the Marines. His name was Smedley Butler. He did us a great service. They hired him to overthrow Rock, uh, Roosevelt in 1933. This, this you can find. In documents, in fact, in 1933, the front page, New York Times, printed for one time what I'm telling you now, and then they didn't print it any longer. They contracted, they thought they did, Smedley Butler to lead his loyal troops on Washington and take over the government. And they were willing to allow him to kill Roosevelt if necessary. That's a very little known fact today, and it's never remembered by the mass media. Henry Ford, personally, James Mooney, the CIO of General Motors, um, John Watson, the um, founder of IBM, all received the Hitler Medal of the Great Eagle, the German Eagle. We see here, I think, or we will see up here soon, two German diplomats <coughs> pinning on Henry Ford that medal. The war in Europe had already begun. Texaco, it's coming there, there's Texaco's man. He was the CEO of Texaco, uh, Reber, 
Torquil Reader, Reber, Reber. He was a, a man of time, you know, a, a, you know, Time Magazine has the man of the year. So I mean, he was their man in 36. He sold Texaco oil all through the war to Hitler and to Franco. And much of it was bought on credit. He didn't know who was going to win, but he was so much a Hitler and Franco lover that he let them have all the oil that they wanted on credit. Well, he got his money back, uh, from Franco anyway. He received Isabella, the Catholic's uh, medal, from Franco's government. I'm sorry, he did not receive a Hitler medal. But the other three I mentioned received a Hitler medal. And one of them, one of these major companies, received a medal from Mussolini. Oh, Morgan. Morgan CEO in, um, in the European area called Grayson Murphy received Mussolini's medal. So while they're trying to get rid of Roosevelt, they're helping fascism in Europe. And they would have helped. In fact, there is evidence of the American Legion and another Liberty Fund that were, that were organized for fascism to kill and beat up uh, union organizers and black people, of course. This is a part of US history that is not forgotten, at least by me, and it's not different, very much different than today. I have much too much information here. Uh, the Second World War, we know, was finally won basically by the Russian people. They lost 27 million people. Uh, in the wars from 1904 to 1945, they lost 45 percent, no, excuse me, 40 percent of the people when the war, the Second World War was over, there were X numbers of people, 40% of them, or the comparable figure, had been killed in these various wars. The United States warred upon the um, new revolution in uh, Russia in July of 1918, along with several countries of Europe, uh, France, Britain, of course, Greece, um, Romania, Czechoslovakia, uh, Japan, they had somewhere around 300,000 troops uh, for two to five years uh, during the Civil War. Uh, you know, of course, their, their mission was to, you know, to stop communism from, from succeeding and growing. They started this war uh, in, 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 in collaboration with the, the aristocracy's army, the White Army, uh, which wanted to return to the monarchy, basically. Um, and uh, the, 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 the general in charge of the, Russia, the U.S. troops uh, uh, later on said he did not understand what the real mission of the United States government was because what they were doing was impossible to win. They were, they were murdering any kind of Russian they found, uh, including U.S. troops were eliminated, eliminated, they call it, you know, uh, entire villages of people. Entire villages. So, uh, you know, Stalin and other leaders, uh, you know, had every kind of reason to be worried, uh, to make errors, to make crimes, you know, s surrounding the wagons. They had never intended, nor did they ever threaten, really, nor did they ever make any moves to invade the United States. There are no Russian bases, either Soviet then or Russian today, bases in Mexico or, or Canada. They made an agreement two times in Yalta and, and Potsdam to divide up Europe when it became obvious that Russia had really won the war and the United States came in very late. They were hoping, along with Britain, Churchill, that's... Mm, watch out, Ron, the language you use about Churchill. He was a great leader to defend his people and a terrible fascist. He wanted to destroy Russia, and he had an operation called Unthinkable, which he would launch on the 1st of July of 1945, a few weeks after they had signed, you know, Germany had given up. Uh, Truman said, no, I mean, he needed atom bombs. He knew that uh, Truman had atom bombs, and Truman said, well, I don't have that many. I've got to use them in Japan. And I need the troops that Stalin has promised me to help me win the war against Japan. So he said, no, I'm not going to approve your program. But his program would have included 
rearming 100,000 Nazi German troops supported by British and US troops to invade and take over the East European countries that Russia had occupied. And if that wasn't successful, they, the plan was to bomb three cities in Russia. Well, a year later, in 46, Truman said, well, maybe that's not such a bad idea. Now we, you know, we, we've got this, uh, we got this, you know, they, of course, you know, major generals, I mean, really big generals, including MacArthur and General Curtis LeMay, said, we don't need these bombs, these, these atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We've already destroyed every city in Japan with conventional bombing, and there's no military objectives in, um, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, I mean, you know, uh, later on, McCarthy wanted to use the atomic bomb against China when, when, when uh, Mao led the revolution in China in 49. He, he wanted to do this so badly that Truman had to fire him. But in, in 45, he was telling Truman, we don't need to use those bombs against Japan. They're already about to surrender. And at that time, the Russians had come in and they were uh, uh, approaching Hokkaido, Hokkaido, and the Japanese army that remained, which was still relatively powerful, was afraid of the Russian uh, might. And, and they gave up. A combination, of course, of the bombings and Stalin's keeping his promise. He kept his promise so much that he didn't support the Communist Party in Greece, which would have won legally in an election, it so looked like, the CIA thought so, and they said, you know, well, the United States is arming the military fascists, we need your help, and Stalin said, no, nope. I made this promise to Roosevelt, I'm gonna keep it. They had this containment policy, you know, they had this, uh, they, they had this idea that they could do their communism in their world and the United States could do their capitalism in their world and, you know, and let it be that. But no, Truman and George Kennan, who was the architect of the Cold War, it was not the Russians who started the Cold War. As I said, they had just lost so many people. You know, the United States lost 400,000 men and women, a few women. That was, point, that was one third of 1% of the US population. 1% of the British population was killed. About 1 million people. So the Russian people suffered and suffered and suffered. And they don't want war, but they want sovereignty. And I'm gonna to get to that when, when somebody tells me I only have seven minutes left. No. Uh, <laughs> so, George Kennan, you know, many of these people who have committed so much murders, they, they, you know, and some of them maybe believe in some kind of God. So on their deathbeds, you know, they, oh, I forgot to tell you about the deathbed of Howard Hunt. Howard Hunt, one of the, one of the perpetrators of the murder of Kennedy and, and also the attempted murders to Fidel Castro, sat on his deathbed to his two sons, and they have recorded it, and it's out, it was out 10 years ago in Rolling Stones, but of course not, you know, not the New York Times or the Washington Post or any of your media that I'm aware of. He said he was one of those who planned the conspiracy and carried out the murder of John F. Kennedy. Interesting. Another person who was also a warrior for capitalism, the weapons industry, you know, 70% of the generals that retire in the United States get jobs in the war industry or the banks, financial world. 70%. <coughs> that figure, in fact, <coughs> comes from a major in Denmark's army, who's still a major, who wrote a chronicle in the Politiken newspaper about a month ago, April 18th, read it if you can. Somebody ought to translate it, it's fantastic. Every word there, he writes about Russia Gate. He, write, he, write, he writes, no, not mostly about Russia Gate, but he writes about making Putin a scorp, you know, a bad guy, whatever, whatever the word is in English right now. But you know, the enemy. Because they need, the weapons industry needs, you know, wars. They, they have to use the weapons. Now, the weapons that Russia has, fortunately, Putin has created a system that hopefully, for some time, will defend them against whatever weaponry the United States has. He started that after attempt after attempt after attempt to have peace, to be friends, to trade 
with the United States. But as I've told you, presidents don't have the real power in the United States. It is not a democracy. The elections, of course, are a total fraud. There's no chance that a real peace person will win any election. And Bernie Sanders is no peace guy. He supported every one of their wars except Iraq. He voted against the Iraq war, and the very next day he voted for the weaponry and the money and the troops that went there. There are no peace candidates in the United States. It's impossible for them to get any media. But even the capitalist class is not going to allow Bernie Sanders to win because he would give some you know, assets, some money, some better wages to the working class. Um, I lost my train of thought. So Putin, yes, uh, Putin finally gave up trying to be friends. And he said uh, to his people, you know, we need to create some, some powerful weapons. And he revealed them a year ago. I reviewed a book recently of a Russian-American who was in the military in Russia and is an expert on, on military weaponry. The book is called Losing Military so uh, Supremacy. Um, I recommend it if you want to know more in details about where the military might is in the world. I'll say, hopefully, in, in enough... Briefly, that yeah. Before Putin, of course, there was uh, there was uh, Gorbachev gave up the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, Yeltsin came in. Uh, Yeltsin was the CIA's man, or or at least the U.S.'s man. Uh, you'll see right there, Yeltsin, the Yanks to the rescue. This is he's a man on the cover of Time magazine again. They say in this um, in this front cover. This is '96. In 93, he had invaded the parliament. It's a, something, a situation similar to on, on the reverse uh, in, in, in Venezuela today. He invaded the parliament because they wanted to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, make a, a trial against him, like impeachment in the United States, because of, of, Puch, uh, because of Yeltsin's, cap he went to capitalism so quickly that within a, f a very few years, with five or six years, poverty had succeeded. Is that my time? From 1.5 million, according to the uh, World Bank, under the Soviet regime, there was 1.5 million, 1.5 percent of the people in poverty, according to the World Bank. The same World Bank in 1999 or 98 came up with the figure: 50 percent of the Russian people were in poverty. The average lay, uh, age of, of, of living, as a li uh, you know, life expectancy, fell from 69 to 64 years and 10 years for men so you know and he, he basically gave his sovereignty uh, the, the russian sovereignty to the russian to the now it's seven minutes okay i kept waiting for the seven minutes um, <laughs> the time magazine writes for four months a group of american political cons cons consulates consultants clandestinely participated in guiding Yeltsin's campaign. They talk about Russia Gate guiding Trump's campaign. Well, they've pretty much given up on this Trump-Putin uh, collision, but they still go on with, you know, poor Hillary Clinton, the feminist Hillary Clinton, about as much of a feminist as the woman who claimed rape after she was so glad for sex with Assange that she she uh, is a Swedish woman, Anna Arden, that she wrote to her friends, oh, I've just met and had sex with this wonderful guy, Assange. He's so great. Come to my party for him tomorrow. About a week later, she went to the police and they said, well, you know, they, they heard him. They said, you know, well, we don't see anything in it. So there was no charges. But somehow or another, another district attorney, a little bit later after Assange went back to London, uh, wanted to investigate again. And all of a sudden, her story had changed. He had raped her. Well, we have a similar situation in, in, um, in Venezuela, you know, uh, meddling in people's elections, for Christ's sakes. I mean, how obvious can it be? First, it, was, it wasn't first, but Ukraine was about as obvious as you could get. I mean, the major person there, Victoria Nuland, Public stated that the United States had given five billion dollars to help the, the fascist and this Poroshenko, who was not a fascist but a real right wing guy, wanted to come into NATO, wanted to come into the EU. 
And you know, they, and she named who would be the next, you know, after they got rid of the guy they didn't like, who wanted to have trade with both EU and the Russians, they had to get rid of him, they tried to kill him. You know, so they appointed who was going to be the next president. Well, there's something happening now, very interesting. I hope this comic becomes a real peace guy. Uh, my train of thought came back. Putin offered to come into NATO. He offered to come into EU. He also offered to stop all the nuclear weapons. Well, Bush didn't accept it. Okay. What to do? What to do? Oh, I'm sorry. One more fact. The United States has 800 military bases with around 1 million troops in 177 countries. The, the Russians have 16 military bases outside their own territory, most of them in, in former republics. Two of them are radar centers. And the, the Chinese have one foreign base in a little land in Africa, Djibouti. Russia spent this year $63 billion on defense budget. The United States spends $1.7 trillion this year. They legally, they, cl they claim officially $750 billion, but when you take into account all of the areas that have to do with war that they don't count as war, like paying veterans who are sick or wounded for life, that's also a war casualty uh, and other things. So we're talking about a world in which the United States dominates militarily totally. There are no there's never been on Russia in, in, in U.S. territory, and, and Hawaii was not U.S. territory, it was a territory, it wasn't a state with Pearl Harbor. There's never been, the United States has never experienced a war. They don't know what real war is, other than their own internal racist war about racism, and of course, capitalism. Now, what to do? A Canadian professor who uh, started this great uh, website called Global Research, his name is Michael Kosudowski, has written that what we need to do is develop a broad-based grassroots network which seeks to disable patterns of authority and decision-making pertaining to war. We need to combine movements. We need to have people organizing everywhere at all levels of society. We need them in towns, in villages, in workplaces, in parishes, we need them in schools of all sorts, in churches. We have done something similar in our history. We did quite well in the 60s and 70s, I must say, also in Europe. We did curtail the amount of years that the Vietnamese people, the Cambodian people, the, Viet the Laotian people would have suffered war. It's been admitted by uh, previous warriors. Even Vietnamese leaders have said, that our protest and our resistance and our firm resistance was civil disobedience and people willing to go to jail for many years and we helped curtail that war. We could do it again. We could prevent another war if we really mean it. And we should convince our climate change or eco change uh, friends to take up the war issue. We know and there are CIA evidence and documents that the Pentagon alone creates more pollution to the planet than any other single institution in the whole world. But most Greenpeace leaders today are afraid to take up the war issue because they're afraid of losing donations. We cannot tolerate hypocrites among our circles, but we shall not insult them or try to push them out. We should try to embrace them. I was at one time here shortly ago, uh, both a member of Greenpeace and a member of a small peace group in Copenhagen. And I tried to convince the Greenpeace people to take up the war issue. And they told me they would lose money. Stefan Hessel, who died at 93, well, rather, in 93, he wrote this fantastic uh, little, uh, little pamphlet that sold 600,000 copies in France overnight. Time for outrage. He tells us that he learned from being in the resistance in France that we need to have outrage, that we need to feel and express our indignation. The motivation, he said, that underlay the resistance was outrage. We, the veterans of resistance movements and fighting forces of free France, call upon the younger generations to revive and carry forward the tradition of the resistance 
and its ideas. We say to you, and I say to you, us, take over, keep going, get angry. The international dictatorship of the financial markets is a real threat to peace and democracy. I feel already here for a day, something I haven't felt in quite a while, a little bit of inspiration. I'm tired of seeing young people look at their navels, these goddamn emails and SMSs. I can't even have peace in the, in the trains and buses any longer. And it's not just the young people anymore, it's gone, coming up to our age. The navel is, is the modern capitalist Western world's God. We need to take back our collectivity, our, common, our commonwealth. I'm so glad for the first time in my life to be here. <clears throat> we need to live like the Bolivian indig indigenous people tell us. Live well, not better. Evo Morales, who's still their president, I had the privilege of being his PR man in the COP19 or Fempton, I don't remember, 10 years ago when it was in Copenhagen. And he's, he's, a, he's a great leader. I, I really, he, he really, after the people, he really listens to the people. And he believes in what I just said. And he's got a little manifesto about capitalism. Capitalism is all about living better. And what does better mean? No end to consumerism. No end to profit. No end to private property. Money. To live well means that everybody, we can't live well if some people are poor and suffering. We can't enclose ourselves in our wall cities. Where I live, I live in a little fisher's house, but just about everybody around me, many of them have been workers of some kind, but they get more money than they really need and they build these villas. And they've got two cars and a summer house. And I don't know what the unions are doing these days. I don't know how the unions think that they can really get a world run by workers if they encourage the workers to get two cars and a summer house. You just get so comfortable, you can't possibly think about making a revolution. And I've, I've been sick by this capitalism. I drink too much. It's a real challenge for me these days not to drink and not to smoke a little Christiania grass. It's my medicine. And most of us are living on medicines. I think the little bit I see of some of you people, you're not living on medicines yet, and I hope that you don't get to that. So, we need to find ways to form a commonwealth for all, and that requires a different economy, and that one is based not on never-ending profit, never-ending greed. Not only is this a disaster for billions of people, but it is killing the planet, and Mother Earth only has so much space in life which the rich and their politicians are killing. We must combine our movements. And I want to end with a poem written by a 20-year-old Danish man who went to Spain and wrote this poem when he was 20 years old and was killed in Spain fighting fascism. It's a little poem. It's called The Naked Human, the Naked Human, written by Gustav Munch Peterson. I am only a human, but I shall one day raise Earth's mountains and let them shake in the ears of those who sleep. I am only a human, but I shall one day take the sun down from heaven and light up all the dark holes with merciless white light. I am only a human, but I shall one day steal the gods' lightning and sweep the earth clean of dust. <laughs>